move fast and break things. A famous adage adopted by many software companies. But what if you're an industry giant where innovation is required, but failure is absolutely not an option? That doesn't seem to be a mix for success. Meet Amdocs, a company with more than 26,000 employees, more than 4.2 billion in revenue, and the expectations for success are a little bit higher. The difference between great companies and good companies, how much your endurance is to failure. Avishai Sharlin is the division president for Amdocs Technologies, a company that works with communication and media companies to help consumers complete more than 1.7 billion digital journeys every day. On this episode of IT Visionaries, Avishai explains how Amdocs uses open source tools to provide the scale and agility needed to operate some of the world's most complex systems, and he reveals why and how Amdocs is helping to accelerate many companies' journey to the cloud. IT Visionaries is created by the team at Mission.org and brought to you by Salesforce Platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Innovate fast, empower every employee, and scale with confidence from anywhere with a customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform. Welcome everyone to another episode of IT Visionaries. And today we have my personal friend, Avishai Sharlin, division president of Amdex Technology on the show. I always get my tongue twisted there. Amdox Technology. Avishai, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. All right, Avishai, you're calling in to tell for our listeners, because we don't always have international guests. Where in the world are you based? I'm based in Israel. Israel. Yep. So it is late night over there right now. Um, yeah, it is nearly 8 p.m. <laughs> well, thanks for taking the time out of your day to join us. You know, one of the interesting things about Amdocs that I've come to learn over the years working with you is Amdocs is one of the largest tech consultancies out there, right? But people don't actually know what it is, even though it bills $4.1 billion in revenue a year, it's publicly traded. Talk a little about Amdocs. I know I've seen the numbers that you have 25,000 consultants worldwide, probably some astronomical numbers, but for our listeners who don't know, tell us who Amdocs is and tell us what you do over at Amdocs. You know, while we were speaking, so we are nearly 26,000 employees already. Um, See, my bad. <laughs> slightly shy over 4.2 billion. I think the interesting stuff you mentioned, uh, consulting, it's only part of what we're doing. We're, uh, what we uh, used to uh, frame ourselves as a product-led service company, meaning that the core assets of ours are products. Uh, I'm heading this... Uh, uh, the technology and product uh, development within the company, everything related to uh, our product offering, the technology, underlying technology that is uh, pushing forward our solution is the stuff that I'm dealing with. Uh, the company is uh, working around the globe, 85 countries. I think that uh, you can find us in more than uh, six or maybe more hundreds of customers ranging from the largest uh, ones like AT&T and uh, British Telecom and Singapore Telecom and obviously T-Mobile and Sprint and Rogers. So everywhere, Europe, Asia, Pac, as I said, 85 countries. And we're doing business with, uh, with them in a variety of technologies. Again, you can find our uh, solutions changing what we used to call the life of uh, nearly 3 billion people around the globe uh, with our solutions. We're touching on a daily basis, one point, nearly 2 billion daily digital journeys. So we're doing quite a lot. Yeah, it's an astronomical number. The company is much bigger than, you know, what most people think of. Talk about a little bit about your role at Amdocs so our audience can get a flavor for how you know what you're about to tell them. Sure. So um, I'm, as you said, I'm the division president of our technology and products, which mainly relates to uh, everything the company is dealing with technology-wise. Uh, I'm the person that needs to define the, our way forward when it comes to what kind of technologies we use, how do we uh, leverage the existing uh, different areas of expertise of ours, the end-to-end -end strategy when it comes to technology, our tools, uh, frameworks. So. To, by, many, by many means, this is the, let's call it kind of the uh, top guy to deal with technology across the company. 
I need to align our portfolio and uh, drive our solution when it comes to our products. Yeah. So huge responsibility, huge scope. You guys work with huge customers tackling massive projects. You said product-based projects. Um, you named quite a few telco companies there. Give us an idea of the type of project you're working on. You know, I'd love to hear a use case just to kind of get in the framework because this isn't just, you know, I think a lot of people, when they think of product-based services or product-based agencies, they think to themselves, oh, okay, you're like a UX company or you're a UI company or you'll help us with our infrastructure. But no, you, you're tackling huge, massive projects where UX is just a piece of the pie. Give us an idea of a project you're working on so our audience can get a scope of what it is that you guys are doing. So a project can range uh, in variety of different topics, but uh, if we start from the uh, core essence of what we're doing, we're dealing with everything related to charging of the network, with the policy, the way that you need to identify the different packets within your uh, core network and decide which one goes to where and how to charge them. Um, you're billing the UI experience, the digitized overall solution that uh, the end customer will feel, you know, how to purchase an end device, uh, the same look and feel that will appear if you're trying to uh, use something from the website, if you're trying to uh, use it uh, from uh, a retail place, or if you are using your uh, end device, be it a tablet or a smartphone. Everything related to the end-to-end -end experience, everything related to the backing solutions to support the end-to-end -end experience, the contact center, the customer engagement, all of those and many more. Obviously, the network aspects. The network today is completely changing to become software-driven. So the orchestration behind it, uh, parts within the overall solution of how you use different virtual uh, components, all of those are uh, you know, pieces of our end-to-end -end architecture. And obviously, customer vars can use those as separate entities or can enjoy the full uh, suite and a solution coming from, uh, from us. And how about yourself? What is your personal expertise that gives you, that allowed you to take hold of this role? Well, clearly everything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's kind of uh, weird because I started my career uh, many, many years back in the network domain and didn't touch it until uh, recently again. But for many years, I was dealing with everything related to the infrastructure of uh, IT, and the infrastructure of big uh, backbones. So um, the network, um, the security aspects, monitoring, operability, everything which is tying or gluing together the IT, the data center, backing, storage, those aspects was the beginning of my career. For many years, I was uh, both creating products, but also consulting for uh, big companies in that uh, domain. And they moved to do a lot of software development related to uh, video conferencing and technologies which are more open in the sense of, uh, you know, touching many, many eyeballs with uh, a lot of work in Asia Pack and the U.S. with companies such as Samsung and uh, TI and uh, Texas Instruments and Intel, obviously HP, Dell and the likes. And then uh, since I've joined Andox for the last uh, several years, I've started with you know, organizing our portfolio of products. At the beginning, it was uh, a hectic job of collecting all the different pieces and now creating the backbone of a product-led company. And then step by step, uh, organizing it to become and modernizing it to take the full journey of uh, cloud native, microservices, reshaping our entire portfolio um, into something new. Um, and lately I took over the entire uh, organization when it, went, when it goes to the, our digital offering, our, what we call in the uh, local jargon, or let's say the telco jargon, our uh, business support uh, solution, the BSS solutions. Those are the system that I related earlier is the backbone of the solutions, the charging, the billing. So the digital solution on one hand, those are the front end solutions of ours the backbone solution of ours, the technology, and then, you know, AI and, and the infrastructure. So huge swath of responsibility that you're, that you're currently overseeing in addition to Amdocs' servicing. Let's dive into some of those subjects so that we can get an understanding of 
you know, where, where you envision the future changing. You mentioned charging and billing specifically a couple of times, which is something, you know, I think for most of us customers, we don't want to think about, right? Because we, of course, we buy services. You know, I know, for example, I'm on a uh, US use as I go cell phone plan. It charges me $10 a gigabit until I use 10 gigabits and then I can get free from that on. So it's basically if I can use less, though, I can pay less. But if I use unlimited, I can have unlimited. Why is charging and billing something that all these major telcos and businesses are trying to focus on? Because I think for a lot of us, we take internet access and bandwidth for granted, especially at the consumer level. We just think to ourselves, oh, you have pipe. You, I should be able to get data. Why does it cost me anything? Give us a framework for why this is becoming a bigger issue and why you, know, you guys are really excited to provide solutions for this. So I think it's a great question because it touches, uh, I think, the variance of what we've seen in the market lately. So you are right in the sense that uh, probably most of the people are, are looking into a very simplistic usage in the sense of, okay, I pay, I don't know, $10 uh, for something, and if I need, I will pay additional five. But think about the following, and let's give some scenarios to, uh, so you have a family, uh, several members, each one of them has different uh, behaviors. So one, one is a student and he wants to, uh, you know, consume more of uh, media. Uh, one is a young boy, uh, a boy going to school, maybe that he needs only, you know, some uh, voice messages and some SMSs and stuff. Uh, your daughter is using more of, uh, you know, the, uh, the social media, WhatsApps, Instagram, those kind of stuff. And you want to uh, either to manage them as separate entities, but overall to provide a holistic plan for the family. Now look at the different characteristics of each one of them, which are completely, uh, you know, not, not related to one another. On one end, on the other end, you do want in some way to uh, inject logic into it. You want to, to have an offering for a family. You want to have a different separate offering for students. You have a third offering, you know, to people who are traveling a lot. Business people, uh, small businesses are completely different from the, you know, the conglomerates, the chains, the, and, and also in chains, you know, we have chains that are spread across the state and some national wide, you have uh, those who are international. Each one of them has a different characteristic. So when in some customer of ours, you can see that marketeers are coming up with different permutation about what kind of would be the best package to cater those people. And we came up to places where they have more than 100,000 different permutations. Now think about it, that you need now to serve <laughs> 100,000 different permutations. So when you look at it, you say, how can you get there? But just think about what you've mentioned now. You know, I have X jigs and I want uh, one more for you. It's, it's suitable. What about someone that is a gamer and wants, you know, 10 times the, the size of bandwidth that you're looking for? and is willing to pay a different packet for it. And we just mentioned, you know, kids which completely do not uh, need the same consumption or the same usage as you mean. Uh, and, you, uh, and you can go more and more about it. We have places, you know, with customers of ours that uh, the population itself is nearly 300 million people. Now, they are changing in some of those places the plan they're using on a monthly basis. So you need now to adapt to a situation that 20, sometimes 30% of your customers are moving from one plan to another on a monthly basis. Now, if you think about hundreds of millions of those, just think about the, the, the changes that you need to make in your software, what kind of agility and what kind of adaptiveness you need to have in order to cater all those permutations. Now, if you look into different areas around the globe, obviously you can see the consumption is different, the behavior is different. In some areas, the ARPU, you know, the, the, uh, the amount of profit is so slow, uh, small and so slim, uh, as opposed you know, to uh, the more wealthier countries. Uh, so it also relates to the simplicity and the ease of uh, those plans. So you end up in a situation that what looks you know, very, very straightforward. And like, uh, all, all I need is like five plans. Suddenly you're getting to hundreds and very soon after to thousands of different plans. Now your end technology needs to support all of those. So at a given, it's a split of a second, and we're speaking about milliseconds usually, 
we need to A, identify you, B, understand which plan you support, C, understand how much you need to charge. Then we need to calculate, you know, did you reach your limit? Should we, you know, tell you that you're like 70% or 80%? And now, again, from a marketing perspective, there are different ways. What do you want to do when someone reaches the limit? Either stop him or try to upsell him something or try to sell a different package. Now, what happens if you stop the usage in the middle of the month and you want to have, you know, uh, an exact uh, status? Or what happens if you join in the middle of the month and a week after you want to change your plan? And, and it goes on and on and on. So you can imagine that there are hundreds of permutations just to start with. And then when you go to the professionals, you know, the, the people that are deep in the trenches, the marketeers, their imagination is limitless. So they can come and say, I would like to have a package that you can get X, Y, and Z. And if you are consuming those, I will give you an additional something. And suddenly the package is no longer just consumption of your mobile. Suddenly maybe it's a movie in addition, or suddenly it's a, an accessory that you can get, you know. Um, so all of those are now packaged into a solution and all those are creating more and more permutations. And all this needs to be catered uh, swiftly and easily through any device you, you'll be using. I mean, this is just a microcosm of what's been happening in the media world where things are becoming unbundled, right? It's typically, the, in my opinion, price and speed is the driver. So in the media world, cable got so expensive, people said, hey, unbundle this for me. I only want to pay for what I use. Cloud native services, AWS, Azure, all of them, they started charging, hey, how did they get you to accept cloud? They said, well, you only have to pay for what you use. You can literally pay me per byte of storage. You can literally pay me per byte of egress and transfer. You can pay me per byte of compute, yeah. right? Now we have serverless compute. And then that idea started like interweaving, right? Because everyone who worked in the enterprise was also a consumer. So they said, huh, well, why can't I just pay for what I use and consume? Because then that's going to be cheaper. It favors people like me because I think to myself, hey, if I knew the price was based on consumption, then I would consume less. But then there's, like you just suggested, heavy consumers who say, hey, how come it's not an unlimited plan? I don't want to pay for what I want to consume. Uh, let's share the cost and distribute it across everybody because <laughs> we already know. I've seen articles about in-network, in-media, about consumers that, let's say, heavy users, right? They stream all day long or they're playing Fortnite for you know 20 hours out of the 24 hours of a day. Yeah. They're heavy, heavy data users. And so you have all these dynamics, but pricing tends to be the dynamic I'm curious to hear your opinion on how, you, because you already hinted at it. So basically, it used to be media companies, telco companies, internet companies, they only offered, like you suggested, just a handful of plans. But like now, everyone wants everything personalized. Do you see a place where we get to the point where the technology and infrastructure supports consumption-based billing? Because if that happens to consumers, I can't wait to make my bills almost nothing. <laughs> so you're right. You're right. And this is exactly where the industry is going. Now, the endless permutations or the endless possibilities is creating a lot of demand from the technology. So in, in many ways, technology needs to cater a world that has, you know, endless options. Some are defined and some are not yet defined and someone will probably touch them in the near future and, and still you need to be adaptable and be ready for those. So when you're building today's solutions, you need to cater yourself exactly to the situation that you've mentioned. You need, to, you need to make sure that, okay, I can address, you know, A, B, C, and probably the list goes on until 100. But yet if 110 or 207 will come the day after, we'll be able to, uh, to address it as well. This dictates a completely different way of architecting and also operating your technology, completely different, uh, open, mindful. And this goes back to what you just said, you know, these limitless opportunities that customers are demanding today dictate a different way to architect your technology. So the, another thing you kind of alluded to was packet importance. You mentioned that, I'm paraphrasing now, but packet importance. And one of the things we talked about with some of our other guests in other domains 
One of them was, for example, autonomous vehicles and how that's going to require data transfer, either computing on the edge or 5G so blazing fast, it's going to be able to send my car's data to a central server who then can then tell me back, you know, for like autonomous driving, you need to hit the brakes. Something as simple as that. That data transfer has to be blazing fast. Now, you also mentioned this packet importance and something I just thought about now is like, you know, is it going to get to that point where networks are then going to be required by government agencies to say, like, I need to treat this packet of data from an autonomous vehicle significantly more important than, let's say, you watching Netflix. So imagine that's where it's going to get to, right? I'm going to be driving and the network's going to know that it's getting overloaded because I have a car with five kids. They're all on the cell network watching, you know, Netflix and Disney and stuff like that. But my car needs to send data to the cloud. It might say to itself, or the government might regulate it so that, hey, that autonomous vehicle's data has to take priority over entertainment. Do you see that coming? Is the government going to put regulations on that? Because it seems too far reaching to me almost because networks, as you know, are interdependent lines, right? You have a line, I have a compute center that you plug my, your data center into my lines. You share and send traffic over my network. So I have network priority for my network, but then I'm also sharing with yours. Like it's, it gets really complicated as to who has priority of packet. So I think you touched several points. All are very, very uh, important. Let's try to, uh, to talk about each one of them separately. So the first one relates, you know, to the, the different characteristics of a given either traffic or someone who's using the network. And you're right, uh, in, in the modern 5G network, we're speaking about network slices. So you will own your own slice, but at the same time, someone near you may need or consume a different slice. And slices are not born equal in the sense that there will be priority between the different slices. So you will be using slice X and I will be using slice X plus one or X minus one, and not necessarily the two of us will enjoy the same priority when utilizing uh, the same area, okay? So this is one angle. The second angle that you've touched is also very important, which is related to security at the same time. So uh, obviously security has priority, but also security has, uh, or cyber threats have a lot of uh, to do with what you've mentioned. So think about the fact that you're traveling with your family, and you're using the network and someone is trying to interfere you. I don't know, uh, there, are, there are many, you know, um, threat attacks over those channels showing how, you know, uh, young, young guys are trying to uh, take over a car. Yeah, you hear about those. Yeah. Or you hear about devices getting hacked all the time, like people take over, you know, baby cameras, whatever. And this is, you know, to an extent, it's also very relevant because uh, you don't want to be in a situation that someone might exploit uh, such a breach. And, and then, you know, it's, it's okay to say that there is uh, someone is trying to hack your computer, but while driving the autonomous car, if someone is hacking you, this is more alarming because it's, you know, it might be a threat on your life. Now, all of those are areas that needs to coexist at the same time. So priority, obviously the cyber aspects, and you've mentioned the third item, which is the edge and, and the need for the mega capacity and the ability. So again, it goes into topics that we, we, we talked earlier. So we need to adapt our charging solution to be able and be completely distributed. We need to make sure that we can uh, allow solution which starts again, in the edge and, and uh, be able to adapt to this uh, mega bandwidth uh, situation on one end. And on the other end, you know, consolidate everything into several places and then uh, conduct the overall uh, calculations and, and changes and stuff that needs to happen. Now, all this obviously needs to run uh, everywhere in, in, in different places around the globe and but also in a local place. So uh, this dictates, again, a distributed and a very, very sophisticated technology behind this. So how about for yourself when, you know, you're talking about these huge projects, makes total sense, but you're also building for the future, which means you don't actually know with certainty any of these new innovations work, right? <laughs> you, you have confidence or hypothesis that it's likely to work, but you don't have certainty. And so you're building towards the future. Now, when it comes to, let's say software native companies, they have, you know, Zuckerberg famously move fast and break things. Well, when they're investing billions of dollars in network, they can't break, you know, it has to work. So how do you go about evaluating new technology, new 
process, new hypothesis? How do you go about evaluating these to have some confidence interval that is likely to work and that you won't, you know, because Amdocs works for customers. You can't blow your customers' money on projects that you don't know. They, they have to work. Basically, it's I know it's, as much as it's a hypothesis and experiment, it still has to work. So how do you go about evaluating technology to make sure that the likelihood of it working is very high? So first of all, you are very right. Think about just the consequences. You know, it happened in the past, very rare, but it does happen that some of the uh, social media apps are not available. And we're all suffering from that. And, and you know, they are, they are immediately everybody says, did you hear that they were down for one hour, two hours? But what is the cost? The cost is that I was, not, I was unable, I don't know, to WhatsApp you or I was unable to send you a, a message or unable, I don't know, to send you uh, something. But what happens if one of those players, you know, the, the AT&Ts of the world or, or those companies are down? This is a disaster. So you are right in the sense that we have zero place to play. Zero. It's like uh, living in, in a situation that uh, failure is not an option. Now, we do need to play, to play with new technologies. We do need to practice with them, but we cannot fail. So uh, you can imagine how many tests and how many quality assurance cycles we need to, uh, to endure. So if, for instance, our uh, technology needs to support 100 million customers at a given point, Often we'll test it with uh, uh, 50 times larger, so 5 trillion. So if we need to support, you know, a database that gets uh, uh, 100, 200, 300 million hits in a day, we'll test it with uh, 30 billion or 50 billion. <laughs> There's some real load testing right there. <laughs> yeah. So only that in terms of, you know, in many aspects, we found ourselves many times, you know, speaking to the uh, Googles of the world and the Amazon of the world, trying to pick their mind about, you know, what needs to happen because we can share the same scale and capacity, maybe not necessarily in terms of, you know, us uh, hosting uh, YouTube, but in terms of our mega customers enjoying, you know, um, this enormous vast uh, needs for always on and and resiliency and, and backup technologies and stuff like this. So this is also, uh, it's unique in the sense that when we try something, we need to stress it a lot. Sometimes it means that you cannot adopt immediately and you need you know, to, uh, to wait until the, uh, the technology matures a bit more or until there is something that, uh, and maturity can go you know, um, in performance for sure, but also in terms of uh, other elements that you've mentioned. You know? It's uh, ready to be monitored in the right way, in the right way uh, that you can provide the right inputs and, and debug it when needed, you know, stuff like this, but not necessarily are coming immediately at, uh, as, as project goes to run. So, you know, you're in this interesting place because you said, you just said it, the, the tolerance for failure is zero. You're always being pushed to handle bigger capacities, more loads. Uh, you already talked about how much stress you'll put under your test systems to mirror to basically 10x what prod is going to see so that you can ensure that it doesn't go down how about when it comes to evaluating new technologies and services because you know there's always there's always someone calling you you know i'm sure vmware's got people calling you i'm sure you know everyone's got someone calling you to say hey avishai i got something new you got to try your customers are going to love it and usually these are going to be major massive investments how do you go about evaluating these things? Do you force all vendors to say, hey, you, I will not touch anything without a specific POC? How do you go about pushing the paces of new technology to know so that you know with certainty this will work? Yeah, so you're right. In some cases, we're using, well, actually not in some cases, in many cases, we're using a lot of open source. So in that, there is no vendor to call. You know, we are always... <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> And in those cases, we're always saying, you know, the, uh, if something goes wrong, we can, you know, we can shout, but uh, only on one, one another. With the big vendors, you're right. In many of the cases, it means that we need to, uh, we need to go through uh, a proper POC. Many of them are, you know, already working in our labs, so it's easier for us to try something of theirs. But uh, we have, you know, data centers spread around the world. Most of them, in any given moment, will be trying some piece of technology and eventually we'll consolidate and we'll see well, how, how does it go with us, you know. 
in many of the cases, uh, even our customers will stress test some of the solution even more. You know, so even if we come and say, look, we already checked it and double checked it and triple checked it, they will say, okay, it's fine. You know, now come to our labs and we we'll check it again. Yeah. Yes, this is the nature of the beast. It can't go down. Now, it doesn't mean we cannot fail because this is a critical message, I think, in terms of culture. When speaking to your R&D teams, it's very important for me. I, I, I'm always showing them like a clip of uh, completely out of uh, sync of this conversation, but probably as you're a sport avid. Uh, you know, Ronaldo is, is a very famous, uh, what we call football player in the U.S. You yeah. A soccer player. You're talking about Christi Cristiano Ronaldo? Cristiano Ronaldo, yeah. And there is yeah. a famous, uh, a beautiful goal of his, you know, and the statistics show that he tried the same kick for 45 times before it went. So for nine or ten consecutive games, he tried and tried and tried, and, and he always failed. And eventually he scored and it was, you know, the most beautiful goal ever and everybody was replaying it and they said he's a genius. No one remembered the 44 times before that, you know, it hit the, um, the, the wall or it hit uh, who knows what. But it's less relevant for me, the, the triumph on one end and the achievement and the fact that he was willing to continue and try. And this is something that I'm always sharing with, with my teams. You know, you, you need to continue and try. We will fail. Uh, probably we're failing uh, quite often, but it's okay. You know, uh, not just because we're human, because this is the only way to stress yourself, to find a new frontier, to, to find a new technology, as, as you actually said. Otherwise, they will never try. We will always go, you know, and be the second in the market or the fourth in the market because someone yeah. has proved it's right. And I don't want to be there. I want to be the first in the market. And, and this is different because if you want to be first in the market, you need to, you need to fail and you need to fail a lot. No, so you're, what you just mentioned reminds me of another. Simeon Dukach is a venture capitalist that we talked with. And one of my favorite examples of entrepreneurship and dedication to perseverance of a goal is James Dyson in the Dyson vacuum and how he famously created 3,127 prototypes that did not work. And so I asked Simeon, I asked him, hey, if you were backing James Dyson, would you keep giving him money? He keeps failing, 3,127 failures. And Semyon had an interesting answer, which I think is similar to yours, which he said, it depends. Could he tell me something that he learned every single time that gets him closer to the answer? Because you're right, to create that product right out the gate, no one's going to hit it on their first try. It's okay, you know, that you have to keep going. If, and if I can, I feel like if I'm, if I'm working for you, if I can keep bringing you something that says, hey, this didn't work, but here's why I think this will work. And it's an educated hypothesis. Now your thumbs are up and you're like, yeah, try that next one. <laughs> yeah. You're right. In many companies, I, I think the difference between great companies and good companies, you know, the, how, how much your endurance is to, uh, to failure. On the other end, you don't, you, you don't want, you do want uh, your people to be smart people. So not to repeat the same mistake twice and then say, it's, hey, it still is not working. Uh, what <laughs> change nothing <laughs> so yeah <laughs> other than that uh, i completely agree i think that if if you are heading the right way eventually it will happen and and you know uh, the more you try and the more you uh, and by the way it also matures your organization because people identify failure much faster they're also getting uh, resiliency they are getting tenacity and if they are getting your backing you find the next leaders you know coming from uh, within yeah, I think, you know, Bezos said something similar along the lines when Fire Phone failed. They spent like over a billion dollars and the phone never took off. You know, they thought because we have this much distribution, everyone's going to buy our phone. And actually, nobody bought it. And he just shrugged his shoulders like that. <laughs> Didn't work. <laughs> Didn't work. Yeah. Not many people can, can lose one, one billion dollars without, uh, without having uh, difficulties later. <laughs> but, but but yes, I understand. It's, it's, it's similar to uh, you know to normal people losing ten dollars. But yes, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's operating on a different scale and plane than the other companies. No question about it. Their revenue, this you know, it's just another. It's another. They just they play it by a different game. How about when it comes to consumer technology, or you can name enterprise technology? What are some of the things that you see coming out in the future that get you super excited, consumer or business side? Well, wow, so many. So let's say, uh, let's see. Um, in terms of, I think it will be a mixture. 
we, we mentioned earlier a bit the 5G angle of, you know, the network being changed. And, and 5G will not bring only the uh, bandwidth and the very, very low latency. It will also bring the capability to cope with the billion different devices coming from IoT. Um, you know, the cameras, uh, be it uh, surveillance or other means, the uh, autonomous cars and, and the different uh, devices out there, splinters or, I don't know, the different gadget that everybody buys and, and, and then, you know, forget the day after. Anyways, there are going to be many of those and the network will cater them. And this is a phenomena that is changing. I think that uh, on top of it, we're going to see more and more the uh, software embedded SIM, which is the, uh, you know, people today need to, to change their SIM once it's going to, to be uh, software driven. This will allow you to have much more flexibility and to have it, you know, as, as the Apple Watch or the Samsung uh, uh, Watch, you'll see it more and more. Those are also solutions that we're playing with. Consumers are becoming, uh, everything needs to be personalized. Everything needs to be in real time. Everything needs, so you'll see a lot of AI driven technologies. Now there is like AI is like, uh, talking about AI is probably talking like uh, everybody is AI today and everything is AI yeah. and everybody can tell you a lot about AI. <laughs> At the end of the road, it will be indeed to try and to uh, really fine tune as much as relevant information about the individual. We talked earlier about, you know, your buying habits. It goes into your consumption habits, driving habits. Um, there are many, many diagrams about, you know, how much Google or Facebook know, knows about you. Um, there is also a lot of information um, that, uh, you know, the rest of the apps knows about you. And, and eventually this, if we don't go to the extreme about how can they uh, utilize it on, on a bad way, uh, I think it will be very vital because it will allow and assist the technology to assist you in a good way. Uh, for instance, to determine if you are looking for additional, uh, as you mentioned, bandwidth because you are, you, you are starting to, uh, I don't know, see more movies or to if, if you are becoming or purchased uh, a game and, and suddenly you, you, know, you consume 16 hours of your day in, in playing games, Fortnite or what have you. And it goes on and on, obviously, about different, uh, different habits and, and you'll see more of these. Once you pick up the phone, uh, it will allow uh, the other party to, to inject some meaningful information. Now, some of it, you know, you can go uh, to the extreme, to the movies about, you know, them knowing everything you do and, yeah, and your working habits and this and that. But again, many of it will be useful for your daily practice, you know, things about uh, things that you really need to uh, and you want to. So the real-time nature of things, everything will be in real-time, everything needs, and, and, and these are topics that we're dealing with. How can AI cater you uh, in a real-time manner? So as you consume it, we already understand a lot of things about what you're doing. Immediately, we can inject this information into uh, patterns that will notify someone once you want to do something what is that something that, uh, so if you will, uh, you know, want to, to acquire a new smartphone, it will allow us to pinpoint in a better way what kind of uh, technology is better suited for you. Or if you would like to up, update your package, in what way we can do it. Now, there is a lot of interaction that we're adding into the way we communicate with you. In the past, you know, you used to get a bill. Now today, everything is an interactive deal. So instead of you are getting an email or a PDF file or what have you, now it can be interactive in the sense that you push on it and immediately it gives you your existing metering and existing information about everything that you consume. You can double click and start to learn more about your behaviors or we can inject also there some additional related information that uh, will assist you, be it whatever, you know, so it's suddenly the, the, even the kind of dull uh, bill becomes, a, you know, a, a piece of uh, interaction between yourself and your, and your uh, provider. In the B2B domain, 
uh, think about, you know, I think one of the interesting phenomena is that in the past, like 20 years back, people said, in work, I have a very strong computer. And at home, it was like, uh, you know, I guess you were not born then, but 20 years ago. But uh, no, I was born then. I'm 41. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, there was like a, a PC with a floppy disk or, or something yep. like this. Now, today, it's vice versa. Today, the, the stronger computers are at home. And at work, you're always saying, you know, bring your own device started from, from the fact that people have stronger compute power at home yep. than at work. And I think that this phenomena changes a lot the B2B environment. And you will see more and more technology that is coming and... Uh, interchange between those two. And obviously, the third mega change, AI, and, and all this is the cloud, which will be everywhere. Um, so cloud is coming, yeah. is becoming distributed, is going, as you said, into the edge. The data center are, are expanding also into the edge, and then the two will, uh, will kind of coexist, and, and you'll find yourself in a hybrid environment, which is, uh, on the business perspective, the data center, and the cloud, public or private, and obviously working from home, everything software driven, everything is uh, intertwined. Interesting period. Listen, I'm not going to be satisfied with AI, and I don't, so I'm not, I agree that everyone's moving towards AI, but I've said this on every episode and I'll say it again. I'm not a big believer in short term or near term consumer facing AI because every time I get one of those automated systems and it asks me to like, Tell me what you're looking for. And I say something, it always comes back. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, dang. <laughs> or some combination thereof. Until we have Iron Man's Jarvis, because Iron Man in the movie, no matter what he asks Jarvis, Jarvis solves the problem. Until we get there, I don't believe we have AI. <laughs> I'm waiting for Jarvis. Once that happens, that's going to be amazing. Okay. That's what you're talking about. Like, recognizes what you intent, what you normally like. That'd be kind of cool. And I do know that a lot of companies are actually pushing towards that where I call it like maybe the Google Googlefication, right? When they go, they don't want dashboards. They want to ask a system like, hey, what was my best selling product last month? Oh, it was a red shirt. How, how you know, in, in the tool also be like, hey, by the way, red shirts are three months on back order. Your estimated forecasting demand is here. Would you like to make the order now? It's like, yes, I would. <laughs> right. That's what, that's what business is going to become. But, you know, I appreciate you, Avishai, joining us today sharing a little bit about what you do and what Amdocs is up to. But right now it's time for the lightning round. The lightning round is brought to you by the Salesforce platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Avishai, this is where we ask you questions outside of the realm of work so our audience can get to know you a little bit better. You ready? Yeah, I am. All right. What is one of your hobbies that maybe no one outside of work would guess that you do? Well, I read a lot. I don't know if it's a hobby, uh, but I read a lot. Uh, and I also like... Uh, to uh, practice uh, yoga. So maybe this is something that no one knows. So I've done yoga. I'm, I'm a big person. So I weigh 245 pounds. I've done yoga before. I look like a, uh, I don't know, like an, you know, like an inflexible elephant, I guess, in the room. <laughs> what is a yoga pose that you can hold that someone will be surprised by? I'm not sure someone will be surprised, but you know, I practice yoga. Uh, I do the basic stuff, not something that uh, will uh, make someone envy at my uh, flexibility skill. Are you, have you ever done Bikram yoga, hot yoga, Bikram, hot yoga? No, no, never tried it. No, no. Only uh, the, the, the um, I'm, I'm practicing something called power yoga, which is a combination between yoga and Pilates. Okay. It's more into the uh, core muscles. So it's a lot to do with your uh, back and your uh, belly muscles, less to do with, you know, stretching yourself. Awesome. Yeah, definitely keep, t keep, take care of that core. That's the number one thing that, you know, it plagues people, which is back pain, of course. So people that do yoga, no back pain. What is a unique thing about Israel that, you know, people that have never visited or never been there that they should know about? Um, I think Israel is, you know, is the cradle of humanity in many sense. All monotheist big religion started here. Um, so obviously Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, more or less. Uh, so you can see all three of them visiting the country. You can see ancient history as, you know, as, as the world shaping up to what we know as the Western world started more or less here. So you can see Ro uh, Roman uh, ruins. You can see obviously the, uh, the Jewish uh, heritage of ours. You can see Islamic 
reminiscences. So it's it's very interesting in terms of history. On one end, on the other end, it's very uh, from nature perspective. You have the Golan Heights, which is snowing now, and you have uh, the Red Sea and Eilat, which you can scuba dive. So you have both extremes, um, and it's a very small country. So in the sense of one, and you have the Dead Sea, you know, the deepest place on Earth, uh, nearly 500 meters below sea level. So you can. Uh, Enjoy all this in like a two days trip. So <laughs> it's a phenomena. Yeah, it's not like traveling in the U.S. that you need to uh, travel for uh, weeks from one place to another. That is a good explanation of why I go. Uh, listen, I've never heard someone pitch it so succinctly. Um, now I want to, I'm interested. Before we go, we got to ask this because a lot of our, we have found out that a lot of our audience also loves to travel. And so that's why I asked you questions about Israel. You're our first well, no, we've had other Israeli guests. By the way, all of our Israeli guests, ultra successful. It's pretty crazy. Uh, <laughs> that's another thing I've learned about the country. What is your favorite Israeli dish to eat? Because a lot of our audience loves food. <laughs> what is your favorite Israeli dish? It's like, oh man, this is, this, is the, this is the thing to eat if you come here. Well, this is a tough one because, you know, if you, uh, Israel is a melting pot. We have 140 different nations uh, coming mm. from all, all abroad. So you can find m- more or less every cuisine on earth. So if you come to Tel Aviv, which is like 24 seven, they're, they're very similar to what you'll find in uh, Manhattan or London, you can eat everything you wish. So if you're into novel cuisine, you'll find the, some of the hottest places on earth that got, you know, very high ranked in terms of the food they, they provide. The, the, the unique stuff is that uh, everything is fresh. Um, a lot of uh, things come from uh, the sea. Um, a lot of things come from home, homegrown, you know, vegetables and, and a, lo- a lot of fruits that uh, we grow. Um, so all in all, this is the uniqueness. Uh, fresh, and Mediterranean, and a mixture between, let's say, the uh, traditional Mediterranean, some novel cuisine. So. Those are very, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of, uh, of good food and, and you can find like the best restaurant on earth uh, over here. There you go. So there you have it. Avishai Sharlan, division president of Amdocs. If you want to help get to the cloud, if you want help building, building charging systems, network usage, AI, Amdocs, Avishai. If you want to visit Israel, go to the Dead Sea, go to the mountains, eat the best food and do some yoga. He's your guy. Avishai, thanks for joining us today on IT visionaries. Thank you, Albert. It was fun and great. Thanks. IT visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experience, empower every employee and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform.